Today is June 25th, 2023. I'm Linda Forsyth with CMINE, and I'm here to go over the uh, the pretrials that went on in Gitmo for the last week from June 19th to June 23rd. It's supposed to be five days of trials, and um, and just to let you know, they're on the uh, calendar, which I'm about to show you, shows it was supposed to go all last week through the weekend, and that is incorrect. On Thursday, they did not have any trials scheduled, and also uh, not this weekend, today and yesterday. Um, I asked why they couldn't keep the calendar up to date, especially since there's going to be quite a few of you that are going to be showing up there in the public access to be able to watch these. And um, they promised that they were going to uh, get a little bit better at that. But that's something to keep in mind for the future. If you're going to show up, um, check ahead of time to make certain that they do have something going on that day before you go all the way down there. Okay. All right. So I am going to share my screen. And I'm just taking you over here real quick ahead of time. Um, same thing I always do. Go to the Office of Military Commission's website. It has uh, the transcripts uh, for all the proceedings that are going on forever, even going way back to the very beginning. There's transcripts there for all the trials. Um, it has uh, your calendar, which I just mentioned to you. Uh, sometimes you need to double check to make certain that it's going on. They have press releases. Uh, here's where you go for the transcripts. Um, it talks about the after cases and et cetera. Now, this last week and actually for the entire month, uh, it is the actual USS Cole bombing. This is what happened in um, the year 2000. They're still in pretrials. I mentioned that before. The June calendar shows what's going on all this month. We like to call it the Nashuri trials. Um, Al Nashuri is who is on trial. And uh, this uh, it's getting close to wrapping up here uh, from what I have been told. <laughs> But we shall see. So we're going to start going over here what, what happened this last week. Now, um, going to the CVINE website, that c-vine.com, c-vine.com, um, we have all of the uh, reports and articles that we are doing to keep everyone up to date, not only what's happening in Gitmo, but everything Gitmo-ish, <laughs> things that are going on. And I am going to cover at the latter end of this after I get through going over this last week, um, some really, really good news. And um, I'll go over that uh, towards the end. So if you need to skip over this, uh, just, I guess, scroll forward. <laughs> but anyway, um, c-find.com, c-find.com. There is a place here to do uh, get no travel donations because we are going to be at Fort Meade to watch the Gitmo trials um, the entire month of August, uh, myself and 20 other volunteers. And so um, hopefully you'll show up too. You know, if, even if you aren't going to report just to meet us and just to watch what's going on, you can see the same thing that we are. And it's exactly the same thing that's going on in Gitmo that's being live streamed in. All right. So this is the other report I was going to talk to you about. Um, if you want to know what the Al Nashiri trial is having to do with the USS Cole bombing, I will put the link in there for um, your uh, for your information. But this explains in depth about what the coal bombing, what happened um, in 2000. A lot of people lost their lives. It's important that you understand why this is um, still going on. You know, let me know if you figure that out. But pretrials, uh, tribunals happen really quick, but it, I guess takes 20, 40 years to go through pretrials. I don't know. This isn't the only one that's in pretrial. This is just the one that's going on uh, this month that we're going to be discussing. So that's going to be there. Now, for the purposes of today, since we do not have anybody in Guantanamo Bay or Gitmo, or excuse me, or Fort Meade to be able to watch the live CCTV in Fort Meade, um, we're going to go with the report from Carol Rosenberg. She is a um, an approved reporter to go to actually be in Gitmo 
to watch these trials physically. She's actually physically on Gitmo uh, to watch them. And she uh, does a lot of her reporting on Twitter, which is um, interesting. She doesn't just do the actual um, New York Times report. She does those too. But for the blow by blow, so to speak, of uh, what's going on uh, every single week, she's actually pretty good. And um, I have personally, and so have others, uh, fact checked to see if you know how much was being left out by looking at the transcripts and everything else. And uh, for the most part, she is very good. She reports in like kind of like a bullet point type style which that's really the only way you can do these. Um, otherwise, you know, just look at the transcripts if you want in-depth detail, which that is available to you on the website that I just showed you. Okay, I am going to start reading. Okay, and here we go where uh, this is going to be last Monday, which I believe was the 19th. And she's reporting the next day uh, because you have to wait until the transcripts come out before you can release anything, just so you're aware of that. But okay, Carol says, good morning. It's day one of week two of these pretrial hearings in the USS Cole case. Here, whoops. <laughs> here is the last um, here. Here is the last hearing session before a long holiday weekend at Guantanamo. Now, um, she also does some of her New York Times reports. So she shows it here. You can go to her Twitter page, which is twitter.com. Carol Rosenberg um, is her handle. Um, you can find these things. You can click on, and it's uh, pretty informative. So she has that there for you. Okay, so she'll replies. Okay, in court now, former NCIS agent Ken Ruwer is recalling the four-day interrogation he and other U.S. agents conducted in Yemen in January 2001 of Jamal Badawi. In the latest installment of testimony in the long-running hearsay hearings, background here, and she has a report about that. So I'm not going to go into that right now. But again, you can go there, click on it, and read it. Moving forward, the U.S. killed Mr. Badawi in an airstrike in 2019, and so he is unavailable to testify at the eventual trial of Guantanamo prisoner Abdu al-Rahim al-Nashiri, which is who's on trial right now. Pro prosecutors want Agent Ro um, Rohr to testify about what Mr. Badawi told interrogators 22, 22 plus years ago. So you're catching on to these things. You're going to start realizing what's going on. Okay. She also has a New York Times report about who this is and what the situation was about that's there. Agent Ruer says he recalls the interrogation because it was so consequential. Also because at one point a Yemeni told a Yemeni told Mr. Badawi the first and last name and agency affiliation of Mr. Ruer, unlike the usual first name introduction, and now dead Yemeni and how the now dead Yemeni threatened him. Okay, about the case. This is one thing that I showed you before, um, a link that I'm going to provide about what the USS Cole bombing case is about. All right. So Agent Ruer says that during a break from the interrogation, he confronted the Yemeni official about the full name NCIS identity. He said his FBI colleagues did not include the episode, including the threat, in the FD302 account of the Badawi interrogation, a deviation in policy. Context. Testimony about this would be testimony, uh, would be <laughs> Testimony about this would-be testimony is mostly not to the substance. It's more about the atmosphere and circumstances of the January 2001 interrogation and after aftermath documentation and a prosecution effort to use it. Defense bid to exclude it from the someday trial. So even they say it, they see this. Okay, she goes on. In court now, the judge is asking whether prosecutors have provided defense lawyers with all the Camp 7 discovery. 
This is about the place where the defendant was held at the time of his 2007 interrogation. Lead prosecutor Michael J. O'Sullivan, not yet. Oh, it just flipped ahead on me just a minute. Okay, retired FBI agent George M. Crouch Jr. is now testifying about his 2002 interrogators with Ali Soufan of Salim Hamden at Guantanamo Bay. He thinks he read an FD-302 account of earlier interrogations of Mr. Hamdan by fellow FBI agent. Mr. Soufan has testified that he did not. As Agent Crouch recalls it, Mr. Hamden was brought before them the first time in shackles and restrained to the floor. The prisoner asked to call his wife to tell her he was alive. They brought a phone with him the next day, and Mr. Hamden recited his wife's phone number. Mr. Hamden dialed her up, let the couple speak for a few minutes, and then Mr. Hamden cried. Agent Crouch cast his, uh, this episode as an icebreaker. Both were family men. He, the, then multiple interrogations would ensue using translators because Agent Crouch speaks no Arabic. Mr. Soufan was his first interrogation partner. He left, and then Agent Crouch questioned him again with a U.S. military translator. After that, another fluent Arabic-speaking FBI agent arrived. Agent Crouch, Crouch is recalling what Mr. Hompton told them in days of questioning. Agent Couch is recalling what Mr. Hamden told him at Guantanamo that he heard in Afghanistan after the 2000 coal attack. The agent says Mr. Hamden said he heard a guy called Bilal brag about the coal attack, invoke the names of the two suicide bombers. Bilal is one of the aliases on the military charge sheet of the defendant in this case. Abdu al-Rahim al-Nashiri, Mr. Crouch says, Mr. Hamdan provided a description of the man he knew as Bilal. Agent Crouch says, in all his time talking to Mr. Hamdan, the prisoner never alleged abuse in U.S. custody anywhere, anytime. Agent Crouch says he was the note taker throughout. When Mr. Sufan, the military linguist, and the FBI agent, Amar Bugauti, were all translating. But towards the end, in the company of Agent Bargauti, Mr. Hamdan complained bitterly about being placed in solitary confinement. Agent Crouch says, although he swore the agents had nothing to do with that, the move harmed the rapport between the prisoner, Crouch and Bugauti. Good afternoon. Following a lunchtime recess in the USS Cole hearings, two issues have emerged. Number one. During the break, defense lawyer and the judge were suddenly handed additional classification guidance on their questioning of Agent Grouch. Judge Acosta says there's friction in the secret document. It doesn't seem to be apparently consistent to me. Number two, Judge Acosta is discussing the possibility of a hurricane forming before the weekend and the general wisdom that people should be prepared for three days without water and power. We're going to reason with hurricane season down here, he says. Oh, we're trying to reason with hurricane season down here. She goes on to say, the judge says, as Pasca Goulon, he's learning three days can be optimistic. The judge adds that one witness and the bulk of the defense team are due to travel to the base on Saturday. I don't know about the wisdom of more people joining on island for that, he says. The defense lawyer, Joaquin E. Padilla, now at Guantanamo, replies that he spent time in Miami and knows the hurricane prep drill. Then Mr. Padilla turns to asking witness George Crouch questions by way of via by way of video feed from the war court annex in Crystal City, Virginia. Mr. Padilla's Padilla has made clear he'll ask more questions than he initially intended in a classified hearing in light of the new secret guidance. Aside, actually the latest track proof provided by the National Hurricane Center makes Saturday travel look relatively favorable ahead of what could be a storm surge and flooding from the dirty side, but it's the aftermath that seems to worry the judge. Interesting. Okay, so 
Then back at the hearing, Defender Padilla is questioning former agent Crouch about questioning detainees after 9-11 at Kandahar, Afghanistan. The agent saw some prisoners loaded onto a plane to Guantanamo. Another prisoner of interest to him was taken away, never to be seen again. He recalls that detainees were brought to him in a tent and shackles for questioning. It was cold and maybe the guards were wearing bal balaclavas. God, I hope I pronounced that right. Balaclavas. He recalls he's not sure whether the detainees were hooded when they were brought to him in the tent. In court now, Defender Padilla has been exploring Agent Crouch's knowledge of the role of Hamadan, Hamdan, the previous FBI interrogations before he he and Mr. Sufan ever got close, ever got to him and the files that were already built, he may have, and he may have consulted. No closed session yet. Agent Crouch says Mr. Sufan would summarize his Q&A with Mr. Hamdan for the agent who didn't speak or understand Arabic. Then Crouch, who served as note taker, would write down what he had been told. Defender Padilla. How do you know the question who translated for you in the midst of your 13 rounds of questioning Ham Hamdan was truly a U.S. military translator? Crouch, I asked the military for the translator. This is the individual that showed up and went into the room with me. <laughs> Again, interesting. Agent Crouch says he considered those 13 rounds of interrogations of Mr. Hamdan with three different partner translators to be one long interview. So the agents did not generate individual FD-302s. <clears throat> now they're discussing the perks the agents gave Mr. Hamdan during and after the one long in interrogations, Subway sandwiches and whatever else the agents were eating, they shared. They gave Osama bin Laden's driver some car and or truck magazines. <laughs> okay, court was wrapping up. Court questioning of Agent Crouch to resume in secret classified session at 1643. Judge Acosta has put the remote hearing room in Crystal City, Virginia, on notice that they'll be going late tonight. No public, no defendant. All right. So I'm going to go over to the next day. Okay, moving forward. Good morning on day two, week two of this round of pretrial hearings at the USS Cole case at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The legal teams are uh, bifur uh, bifurcated between the courtroom in Cuba and the court annex in Crystal City, Virginia. She also provides, again, a link to if you want to know about what the coal uh, bombing case is about. Okay, the judge is on the bench. The defendant is absent. An army lawyer from the prison staff testifies that the defendant, Abdi El Rahim El Nashuri, chose to waive attendance because he has a medical appointment back at the prison at 2 p.m. Okay, aside from here, this is not what it says, it's what I'm going to mention to you. Anytime the trial is at the very beginning of the week, the very first one, the defendant is required to attend. Um, even though it's been over 20 years, they, at least on the first day of the trial, they need to be there in the courtroom. This is day two. And so, as you can see, more often than not, they choose not to be there. So while you are there in Fort Meade, those that you choose to watch these, these are things to keep in mind when you choose to come watch the actual proceedings being live streamed in. That if you want to see the actual defendants, you should probably be there on the first day. But check first to make certain that it's going on. Okay, so moving on. The judge asked if it was an emergency. It sounds like this is a routine session with a senior medical officer, a doctor. Prosecutor <clears throat> Tess V. Schwartz, a Navy lieutenant, asked the judge to find the waiver, um, asked the judge to find the waiver voluntary. Defender Anthony Natali objects. He says medical appointments confront the prisoner with a choice between health care and his right to be present. He says the defense team have no control over the prisoner's medical appointments. 
The judge disagrees. He says Mr. Nishuri regularly does not attend the commission on Wednesdays. He says this session has been set for around a year. Adds earlier testimony shows prisoners get regular access to health care. He finds Mr. Nishuri voluntarily absent. Now there's some back and forth about the incomplete discovery about the government about Camp 7. Lead prosecutor Michael J. O'Sullivan said there's more classified material being examined in other capital cases by the September 11th child judge. Mr. O'Sullivan says prosecutors knew these records existed, but he believes that they are probably superfluous, but not going to say no possibility. He says the Nashiri defense team have affirmatively sought them. Mr. O'Sullivan also tells the judge that the prosecution has uncovered some of 16 videos of forced cell extractions of Mr. Nashiri from 2006 to 2007, around the time the prisoner was brought to federal agents to describe his role in the USS Cole attacks. Aside, a forced cell extraction, or FCE, is a trademark Guantanamo tackle and shackle technique typically done by the U.S. Army's guards in jet black riot gear to force a disobedient prisoner from his cell. Here's a training image from the prison's now defunct public affairs team. Okay, on these just uncovered vintage FCE photos, Prosecutor O'Sullivan explains that the defense team cannot have them, even under classified classification limits. They are display only. A Gitmo category used in the past to mean a defendant can see something but not have a copy. The lead prosecutor explains <clears throat> that his team has shown one to the defense lawyers, and we are in the process of making them disclosable. But neither the judge nor the defense can get copies just to see them. This puzzles the judge. Colonel Acosta wants an exclamation. Can they be shown in a closed court session? Why can't the judge or defense have copies? Tactics? What's at risk? Mr. O'Sullivan, it's been cleared for display only. That's about all I can tell you at this point. So um, aside getting a little bit of a clue here of why these pretrials are taking 20 years. There's a million different reasons. And here's another one. It's the classification processes, what needs to be in closed hearings, what is considered classified, what is considered controlled, unclassified information. There's all these different, various different things that, that go on. And some are considered under the classified section. It's just varying different degrees and so on. It's so it's it's an ongoing saga in that respect. Okay, moving forward. Prosecutor O'Sullivan has now elaborated that the government needs to do something to these videos to show them to Mr. Nishiri's lawyers. A shortcut around the court 505 classification process of showing a judge before and after to weigh whether it's a suitable substitution. <sighs> The prosecutor, we need to do certain things first to make them displayable. Otherwise, we need to put them through the 505 process. Aside, intriguing, he does not explain whether they are blurring the name, tapes, faces, tactics, security cameras, or sound. Moving forward, the hearing is in morning uh, recess following a long exchange about info, evidence, discovery. The defense team argues is still do them before they can do closing arguments on several crucial pretrial motions. Part of this is a race against the clock towards the judge's retirement. Remember that. Did you read that? Part of this is a race against the clock towards the judge's retirement. So if the judge suddenly retires or um, is going to be retiring once that's gone, the question is what processes are they going through or even can they once the judges retire, where they have to go through the voir dire and everything else to find a new judge, which is another lengthy process that has to be uh, conducted uh, with both the defense and the prosecution deciding whether or not the new judge is um, considered 
whatever. So that in and of itself can be a problem. Plus the judge, new judge will need to have a certain amount of time to familiarize himself with a 20 years saga of uh, pre-trial and et cetera. So he can be, or she can be figured out to be uh, up to speed on things. Okay. So moving forward, the newly disclosed, but not yet available 2006, 2007, uh, camp seven videos would seem to implicate voluntariness in this crossroads decision confronting the judge. And she has a New York times article here that you can click on and read exactly what the case is nearing a decision on the lasting effects of torture. A military judge heard from the final expert before he decides whether interrogations at Guantanamo were contaminated by years of CIA, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> okay, so when the court returns, it's dueling experts day on the integrity of photo book identification. Back in the early 2000s, federal agents used a photo book of people of interest rather than a more standard photo array to identify Al-Qaeda suspects. Okay, so moving forward on to the next day. All righty, day three of week two of the USS Cole hearings is underway. The media room internet is down, but I, MacGyvered, <laughs> uh, this is one important update. Judge Acosta has announced that the MC, uh, the CMCR panel declined to stay the hearing and he's no longer bound by these limitations. So appeals panel is examining Guantanamo judge's next job on ethics. The issue has cast a cloud over the coming proceedings in the USS coal bombing case, which are scheduled to last three weeks starting, which was this week. So that's an older article, but that is something that you may find of interest and in what the issues are with this judge. Who knows what's going to come up with that, but something to keep an eye on. As she moves forward, you know, I want to make certain I didn't forget something. Okay. Um, it says, uh, comms for war court media a fail today, hoping they will fast track today's transcript. What's so strange about the judge's announcement is that military commission's headquarters cannot or will not release the CMCR decision. Wonder if it requires some sort of an intel scrub. As these photos show, the no media coverage ceremony was held in the baseball room that covers as a bingo parlor at Guantanamo Bay. Here's a report on the post 9-11 legacy security operation that has packed up their fast boats and gone home. And uh, it's an interesting thing about what's going on with the Coast Guard. They no longer are uh, patrolling the waters. It's been taken over by the Navy and the Marines. While those Coast Guard fast boats armed with uh, 50 cal machine guns at Gitmo are now a thing of the past. So it's a brief statement. Coast Guard ends post 9-11. Anti-terrorism patrols at Guantanamo Bay. Special teams were sent to the U.S. outposts in Cuba after September 11th attacks. The Coast Guard says the Navy Sea Patrol assumed their duties. Forgive me. Okay, I've looked through these. You know, the next couple of things I believe are you, what she's using is fillers. Um, the next day, there isn't any court scheduled, which is on Thursday. And so there's one day after this. But some of the things she has here, I think you may have find of interest. All right, she goes on. A dozen years after the government said none existed, uh, none existed, prosecutors disclosed that they have found videotapes of a prisoner being forced from his cell in Guantanamo's now defunct, then clandestine Camp 7. 
And here's his uh, prosecutors disclosed discovery of secret Guantanamo prison videos. A war court prosecutor said the videos, which could cause more delays in the destroyer, destroyer coal bombing cases, were so sensitive that the public, et cetera, et cetera. So there you go. There's another example of what's going on and why and, and et cetera. The prosecutor, the government, they're coming up with this stuff now. Okay, and then uh, Carol goes on to say, in 2017, the prison published a photos of soldiers training on how to do a forced cell extraction. Okay, so she shows some pictures there. And uh, then she goes on to say, defense lawyers in the USS Cole case have been asking the government for videos from inside Guantanamo's most secret prison since 2011. The war court prosecutor said today that some have been, lo uh, been located, but aren't ready for the judge and the defense lawyers to see it yet. <laughs> Prosecutors disclosed discovery of secret Guantanamo prison videos a war court prosecutor said the videos, which could cause more delays in the destroyer coal bombing case, were so sensitive and so on and so on. Okay, and then she also goes on to say the military says even the drawback, drawdown, <clears throat> that the Guantanamo detention operation workforce remains at 1,000 troops and civilians assigned to the operation holding 30 detainees. Okay, now this is completely aside in my own opinion. Obama, when he was in office, had been trying for many years to close down Gitmo. What he wasn't able to accomplish it. And there was attempts even after uh, Trump got into office. But Trump is the one, and I want you guys to hear this, that opened up these proceedings to the public. And I firmly, fully believe that that was a tactical, strategic move to get the public to watch these and to be able to see the daily what's going on, especially after so many years. Okay, so it was in January of 2019 that the public viewing room was opened on Fort Meade so the public could view these trials that were being live streamed in from Gitmo. So you've just seen a couple of the things going on now. I think if, as you continue to move forward, you're gonna have a better understanding and realize, well, you use your own thinking. Um, a lot of people, uh, they've been trying to close down Gitmo for years, but there's a reason they're stopping it. And it isn't just to keep these going forever. Because they're in plea deals, they're trying anything and everything to just make it so this doesn't go to completion. Just keep your eyes on and continue to observe by also being wise and using some critical thinking and quite frankly, suspicion. Okay, so she goes on about latest Hurricane Center Tracks for tropical storm Brett suggest a favorable conditions for travel to and from Guantanamo Bay this weekend. Too soon to know what complications the weather event forming behind Brett will bring. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next day here. Okay, this is from Carol's last day in Gitmo. She states, it's a big weekend for the history buffs at Guantanamo Bay. The Navy base of 6,000 or so residents is commemorating the June 1898 Spanish-American War battle that gave the U.S. its first foothold on the remote outpost in southeast Cuba. Okay, the base is holding a hike and a graveyard commemoration. Also, no kidding, two screenings of A Few Good Men at the Open Air Cinema on Marine Hill. That is interesting, don't you think? On the movie, it was not filmed. It was, okay, it was not not filmed at the base, but some of the movie makers made the site visit, uh, makers made a site visit before making it elsewhere. Journalists arriving at the base today for next week's military commissions. Hearings are forbidden to cover these events. But here's a glimpse of the sites from earlier for more accessible visits. 
So she has some pictures here you want to see at the uh, the old graveyard. I don't know why they would make this so journalists couldn't cover it. It's just, they're stopping a lot of things. Okay, moving on. About 40 passengers are bound for Guantanamo Bay today on a 250-seat war court charter. Some to observe, report on, or testify at next week's pretrial hearing in the USS Cole bombing case at Camp Justice. And again, she has uh, what to know about the death penalty prosecution, if you want to know what this case is. Uh, she states, the judge and some defense and prosecution lawyers are already down there, also translators, stenographers, and other contract court support now bivouacking at Camp Justice's trailer park. It's near a couple of beaches that are particular faves of the unaccompanied population. So just about everybody that goes there has to have a guard, has to have accompaniment, including journalists, just so you're aware. They just don't have free range to go around snapping pictures. And what they are allowed to be able to do, even reporting, everything has to be approved before be, uh, allowing it for release. And uh, this uh, one person asked her a question, why are they forbidden to cover certain events? And Carol states, not sure. There's an overall anti-transparency trend down here. This event installing the 22nd commander of Guantanamo Prison Operations, Colonel Matt Jamont, on the right, replacing BG Hipaka on the left, was also closed to media coverage. And somebody says that's a Puerto Rican flag. And uh, she says some sort of a unity thing hanging on base housing. That's also kind of interesting. Let's kind of, we'll see here. All right. Puerto Rican soldiers were among the first and longest serving group in Gitmo. True. Those Army National Guard forces were always hurricane ready and an easy C-130 hop home for vacations from the prison deployment, but didn't live in that neighborhood. All right. That took a little bit longer than I expected, but I'm still going to very quickly go over uh, what I talked about on the sideline, uh, the good news. And uh, you may have to do a little bit more due diligence. I have done another video, just so you're aware, that goes over what I'm about to talk to you about in much more detail, but I will not be able to place that video on probably YouTube and some other places. So if you want to know some background, some um, behind the scenes situations that is actually quite important, um, I am going to be posting it on Rumble. And uh, also a couple of the social media sites. And of course, it'll be on our c-find.com website, c-find.com website. And by the way, if you like this video, please like it. If you're not a subscriber, please become a subscriber. And uh, also, um, you know, becoming a member is helpful. Donating to help us when we go down to Fort Meade will also be very, very helpful. I'm going to pin some information um, up at the top in the comments and so on, so you know where to go and what to do with that. All right. This is what I wanted to go over real quick that happened just a couple of days ago, and it is of significant importance. Okay, don't just blow this off. Okay, House of Representatives passes bill banning the Pentagon from funding rating agencies of news organizations. Okay, CBI News was relieved and frankly elated that the House of Representatives actually stood up and passed a bill preventing the Pentagon from funding rating agencies such as NewsGuard. It's a beginning and will probably set a new precedent. But we shall see. In the meantime, we are providing the following report released yesterday by the Daily Caller that you can read here. I also have a link that will take you there uh, directly. Seabine has provided an opinion statement from our eyewitness investigation because we were under NewsGuard scrutiny and rating process for quite a few years. Uh, it's at the end of this report uh, that was written here by the Daily Caller. Okay, the report is House Committee passes rules banning Pentagon from funding censorship organizations. So before I move forward, I want to make something clear. I am not in any way disparaging or lumping everyone 
who works at the Pentagon or various different government, DOD agencies, uh, FBI, CIA, into one basket of whatever. Okay. As in any situation, there are good apples and bad apples. And some of the questionable situations are in very distinct places. And even the people that are responsible for some of these things uh, are not visibly seen to the public eye. There's behind the scenes individuals that are pulling strings in my personal opinion. So please keep in mind, this is not an overall end all situation, but the Pentagon doing the funding, uh, you know, for the rating agencies like NewsGuard, which for us, we were an eyewitness personally, were censored horribly. And also, if we did not comply, then that was um, a major situation of how we, for the most part, got blackballed. Now, I'm going to, I have this article on the website. But there is one thing I want to read to you that the reason why this is so important is an aside of what it does not say here. When we were going through the rating process just this last year, um, it was at the very end of 2022, uh, just before uh, January 2023 is when it ended. That's when we always get annually uh rated and this particular rating we were doing the 9-11 court of public opinion the reason i'm bringing this up because it specifically has to do with gitmo okay and so um we had uh professor leroy halsey who did the forensic analysis at the university of alaska fairbanks we've had uh, a multitude of architects and engineers licensed uh individuals that have done the peer review of the forensic analysis. We've had a number of um, very credible individuals that were worth listening to on our roundtables that we were putting out there of findings they had in analysis and uh, explanations on why things or things could or could not be, various different architects and engineers, et cetera. In the past, we were always told by NewsGuard that no matter what we had, if it did not correlate with whatever alphabet agency um, in the past, well, if it was medical, it had to do with the CDC, the AMA, uh, the uh, uh, WHO, WHO, um, all those, those are the ones that had the final say of what was considered factual. And it was their guidelines and et cetera on what they published and put out. Didn't matter what anyone else thought. That is part of what places like NewsGuard did. Um, so this time when I, they started telling me that, that uh, what these architects and engineers and these forensic analysis by Professor Halsey and everything, what they said was misinformation because it did not follow the NIST narrative. Well, this time, for once, it a little slow. I'm surprised this didn't come to me earlier. And it's like, oh, really? Well, let's discuss this. This um, alphabet agency, uh, be all, end all, final decision maker of what is true and what is factual. Then why is it that you are allowing gross misinformation to get out to millions and millions of people about what is happening at Gitmo? How come I have not heard of one single circumstance of any of these rating agencies going to proverbial news agencies and holding feet to the fire of something that is grossly misinformation? And I was asked, well, what, what do you mean? And I said, because of the regulations of one of your alphabet government agencies that specifically are in charge of Gitmo, the Office of Military Commissions. They have regulations 
that go alongside not only the Constitution, but the Bill of Rights, but their regulations specifically state clearly that no Americans, never, no American citizens, even if they have a dual citizenship, can be detained, tried, convicted, or prosecuted at Gitmo. Can't be done. And I said, this is what the regulation said, and it's going to be what I'm going to read to you now. And I go, please fact check me. Prove me wrong. Where does it say that any of these things that are coming out from these other news agencies, you show me where it is even remotely factual, specifically because of what the Office of Military Commission's regulations state. So either A, they are just negligent in allowing all this information to virally get out there and misinform millions and millions of people. They're just misinformed or it was purposeful. You decide. But anyway, so I gave her the regulations I'm about to read to you. And I said, I want an answer back on where you've been. Why hasn't NewsGuard or any of these other places been calling out? It's not just one or two. These are people that a whole lot bigger following than we have. How come they haven't been called out? Why? I have not heard a single word from them since. That was it. It was done. It was over. And then this ruling came out, especially after we found out that it was the Pentagon funding them to the tune of $750,000 in 2021 for the year 2022. Three quarters of a million dollars? Really? A grant? But anyway, so the House of Representatives and uh these individuals in there, they stood up. They stood up for us, you guys. This is a huge step forward. And this report, I'm going to ask you to either go to our website or listen to what I have to say on Rumble. But for right now, I'm just going to read to you, and I will post this because I have posted it a couple of times, is what the Office of Military Commission says their regulations are. Who can be tried at Gitmo, MMC, it's in the MMC 219 edition, MMC 219 edition, sorry, <coughs> from rule 202, A, in general, any alien, unprivileged, enemy belligerent is subject to trial by military commission under chapter 47A of title 10, United States Code. Definition under Rule 103A. One, alien means an individual who is not a citizen of the United States. Definitely, definition under Rule 103A. 29, unprivileged enemy belligerent means an individual other than a privileged belligerent who A, has engaged in hostilities against the U.S., or its coalition partners, or B, has purposefully and materially supported hostilities against the U.S. or its coalition partners, or C, was part of Al-Qaeda at the time of the alleged offense under Chapter 47A of Title 10, United States Code. In the meantime, AE 911 architects and engineers and 911 and a number of other of uh, architects engineers professors and so on are in a lawsuit with NIST there is some overwhelming evidence that they want to have uh, the presented and they want answers to why they state some of the things they do i'm not going to go into that here but people are getting really fed up okay and i understand in fact, even Carol Rosenberg here mentioned about why would they have all of this, you know, plus building up and, and things that are going on for just 30 prisoners. Yes, I think there's something else going on, but it is not closed classified hearings. There's something, I don't know what, 
but this is what's going on and it's what's going on here you need to take close attention to so even though it isn't all of this fanfare and uh i don't know entertainment sensationalism start understanding what is going on okay friends okay i will be back tomorrow and have a wonderful day it was a pleasure and <laughs> it is certainly getting interesting next week we got some other news that are coming up that I think you'll be quite happy for. So anyway, like the video. Have a good day, folks. Bye.